We are in week four of a sermon series on building healthy relationships at work, at home, at uh, church, in our communities, wherever we are. Relationships are some of the most fulfilling and most frustrating parts of our lives. Today we talk about one aspect of relationships, and that is communication. What we say and how we say it, and why that matters so deeply as persons of faith. Would you pray with me? God of grace and God of love, thank you so much for your presence with us today and always. Thank you for the gift of Whitney and her family. Thank you for the gift of this church, for the music, for all the ways that you use this church in ministry. Lord, today we also thank you that you speak to us and through us. Help us, Lord, to listen for you more clearly. In all of this, we lift to you, praying that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our redeemer, and our refuge. Amen. Well, I still remember a homework assignment from one of my language arts teachers when I was in elementary school. She asked us to go home that night and write one paragraph about how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then when I went into class the next morning, I saw five items on a table in the front of the classroom. A loaf of bread, a jar of peanut butter, a jar of grape jelly, a knife and a plate. So the teacher asked for volunteers to stand up and share what they had written, and she would follow what they said. So one boy jumped up eagerly, and he said, this is easy. And he lifted up his paper and said, put peanut butter and jelly on the bread. And he sat down. <laughs> so that's exactly what the teacher did. She picked up the jar of peanut butter and the jar of jelly and put them both on top of the loaf of bread. The little boy jumped back up, wait, that's not what I meant. She said, that's what I heard you say. How could you make it clearer? He said, well, you have to take the bread out first. So she took the bread out of the bag and left it in this big, tall, wobbly stack and then put the jar of peanut butter and the jar of jelly on top of that tower of bread and he said wait that's not what i meant and she said that's what i heard you say how could you make it clearer and on and on it went for about an hour until we finally got one really good peanut butter and jelly sandwich and we made it right i learned a lot that day in the fourth grade Words matter. How we put them together matters. And communicating clearly with them is a tricky business. Whether you're making a sandwich, extending empathy to a friend, or trying to pitch in and help out a classmate. George Bernard Shaw wrote that the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Getting the words right, though, is a minor part of the story. It's how we embody them that matters. Words make up only, I read, about 7% of our communication. Tone counts for 35% and body language makes up the rest. So how we embody what we communicate may matter even more than the words that we choose. 
communication, or rather the lack of it, is one of the leading reasons that relationships can fall apart. In marriage and friendships, parenting, the workplace, in communities and churches too, when communication is careless, not handled well, the damage can be lasting. When we don't share well, use the words that are most loving, when we don't listen as deeply as we could, people feel unheard, unseen, misunderstood, overlooked, and not valued. It's vital that we give communication the thought, prayer, love, and intentionality the other person deserves. So in order to do that well, we follow best practices, right? Things I'm sure you've all heard before. Things like using reflective listening and making I statements like I feel, I think, I am. And taking the time to get in touch with ourselves to learn why we react the way that we do to particular triggers and circumstances. So we can identify those patterns and manage our reactions in healthy ways. In other words, we need to know our own stuff so it doesn't impede effective communication. So we can be there for each other. We can't change our wiring, but we can change what we do with it. And that's not news to many of us. We've known our own wiring perhaps a long time. And there are helpful tools out there that can help us get a handle on it. And if you want to know more about that or resources, I can share that with you later or sometime this week. Emotional intelligence has long been part of HR and leadership development, counseling, clergy training. But why does it matter at church? Why does this matter as persons of faith? Colossians helps us answer those questions. Verse, <coughs> excuse me, verse 3 says, we are to look for those moments and capture them in which God will open to us a door for the word that we may declare the mystery of Christ so that we may reveal it clearly. And how do we do that? Well, verses 5 and 6 help us out, and I quote, to conduct ourselves wisely toward outsiders, making the most of it, making the most of that time that our speech would always be gracious and seasoned. Or as the message translation puts it, to pray that every time we open our mouths, we'll be able to make Christ as plain as day to others. Our goal is to communicate clearly the love of God in Jesus Christ to the communities in which we live, to make the gospel evident in all our relationships. It's our responsibility through words and how we say them, through actions and how we live them, to bring the grace of God to life at Safeway, at the farmer's market, at school, at Fort Belvoir, in Old Town, along Route 1, wherever we are. As persons of faith, we represent more than ourselves when we walk around out there, you know? How seriously do we take that? If we held up a mirror to ourselves during the day or had someone follow us around with a tape recorder, what would we find? I imagine there are things we might find that we wouldn't like. Those disapproving looks or words that condemn or biting back instead of answering more carefully in love. The greatest of these is love or perhaps giving judgment that it's not a good place to give, overreacting, ignoring. We know what we do. 
I told my husband earlier this week um, that I was going to give a sermon on practicing healthy communication. He laughed and then gave me one of those looks like, maybe you shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> he and my sister know far too well how I tend to take out my stress and frustration on the people I love the most and then can turn right around and be so gracious to someone I've never met. I don't like that about myself and I'm working by God's grace to change it. This is the nitty gritty stuff, isn't it? Of living out life and faith in all of our relationships. And every time I mess up at home and do that, I almost always catch it. But then I feel like that little boy in my classroom standing there saying, wait, I didn't mean it like that. And I can hear the Holy Spirit speaking to me like my fourth grade teacher. And how can you make it clearer? How can you make the love of God that you actually do feel for this person clearer? Adam Hamilton in our conference last week shared a model from Ron Heifetz about this issue. He said on the one level we have the church as it is or us as we are. And on this higher level we have the church as God calls us to be, and us as grace is shaping us to be. And in between, there is this gap for growth and the work of grace. And so how do we close that gap? How do we make the gospel message clearer? Well, let me tell you a story from my first job as a youth minister. When I was in my early 20s, right out of college, a family of six moved into the area. And that family struggled in every way, and I will not tell you the stories that I heard about what home was like. Well, one night when we were having youth group, the oldest child in that family was a middle schooler. I'll call him Albert. Albert came in and interrupted youth group. I had seen his face in the church basement windows long before he decided to come in. And when he came in that night, I welcomed him, and then we later regretted it. Because in that one evening, he offended almost everybody in the room with insults and racial slurs and language I was shocked to know that a middle schooler had learned. And I sent him home because of it. He soon disrupted not only that one night, but our whole youth ministry program as he continued to come. His behavior and language was so offensive that long time faithful families in our church threatened to pull out. They pressured me to uh, kick Albert out of the youth group. And they threatened a number of them to just leave the church. I almost lost my job over the debate. Those families who had been Christians the longest in that youth group were embodying at church what people had been communicating to Albert his whole life, that you aren't worth it, and you don't matter, and let's just get rid of you. And the way that the church communicated God to him, that it looked like God confirmed it, my heart was broken, and I was mad and so frustrated, and I did not know what to do. So I turned to scripture and started where our passage from Ephesians starts tonight and we started with prayer. Because on one hand, right, I get it. 
It was hard to be around Albert. He was a difficult kid, and I get it, on that one level, right? He was offensive and disruptive. But on this other level, I knew deep down in my heart that God was calling us to live out grace. We didn't know how to live yet. And we had to grow to get there. And so with the same mouths that the youth had just used to complain to me again about Albert, I asked them to use their mouths for prayer. They gave me a look, but they didn't. Those leaders stepped up in that youth group and they did it. And I said, we're starting with prayer and we're starting with gratitude and we're going to thank God for Albert and his family and lift them up. And so we did. And we continue to do that. And I asked those children to pray for Albert every single day and they did. And God began to change their hearts and change what was happening in our youth group and in our church. And we started to cling to that verse that Annalise used today in her children's sermon. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And I talked to Albert about his behavior, and we set some boundaries. It was a long, hard road, but boy, was it worth it. Because the church stepped up by God's grace, and Albert learned a Jesus far more authentic than the one they had presented him to begin with. And at that church, Albert was given a gift, and he was known and seen and loved and valued for the first time in his life. And you know what he did? He started bringing his younger siblings along with him so we could love them too. I am so thankful that we kept working at that to make that sandwich right. How can we make the gospel of God in Jesus Christ clearer? We live in a world of people, in a community of people hungry to be seen and valued and heard and loved. And we as the church stand in a unique position to offer them that by the grace and love of God in Jesus Christ. That's what God's grace and love offers because God made each one of us in this community to begin with and loved us from the start we get a chance to put skin on that and words to that and actions to that to make it sing and live and breathe in our midst. It's our responsibility. It's our mandate as the children of God and disciples of Christ to bring grace to life within our midst. Mount Vernon, Fort Hunt, Route 1, this community in which we live is meant to be different because Aldersgate is here, because God has placed us here and wants to use our words, how we put them together, how we say them, how we act, who we are with others every day to make a difference. When we speak, we represent more than ourselves. When we act, we represent more than ourselves. How is Christ inviting you to make the grace of God clearer? For the Alberts of this world and for our community, because boy, does it matter. How are we, like those in my fourth grade class, working at it to make it clearer? Amen.